going to learn a little bit about the blessing Hanotain Leyoef Koach that God gives to the tired, He gives power. <clears throat> First of all, this blessing is um, is very interesting because when we wake up in the morning, we're usually not tired. Usually we wake up in the morning, we are uh, refreshed. So this blessing seemingly refers to uh, that when we went to sleep, we were tired. And now we woke up, so Hashem gave us koach, gave us power because sleep gives us power, energy. We wake up like new people. That's a, that's the simple meaning. <clears throat> but like all the other blessings, uh, if if we look into them, so there's there's a little bit deeper reason, and a, a bit of a deeper praise, and also acknowledgement that we're giving here, because God does not just give us uh, things that we should just enjoy. It, God, the greatest gift that God gives us is um, responsibility. That's one big difference between an animal and a human being. Animals also go to sleep, and when they wake up, they're energized. But animals d don't have any sense of responsibility. So we have to use what we God gives us in a responsible way. And this responsibility is the biggest gift that Hashem could give us, the biggest gift that God could give us. Of course, it's a great gift to be to have to be energized, just like it's a big gift to have eyes and to and to have ears and etc. But and we must give thanks to God for that. But and we're obligated to give thanks. That's one of our responsibilities. That's another difference between animals and man, is that animals don't give thanks. Maybe they can be trained. Animals can be trained to um, to know their master. But as far as gratitude, it's hard to find. Even though I know I've also seen uh, movies about Lassie and how he saves the his master and etc. So, you know, maybe there's some degree of of thanks that there is there, but not to the degree of of um, <clears throat> a idealistic thanks that you thank for thank God for an idea, a fact that we are beginning. We God gives us power and gives us energy and gives us eyes and etc. They were giving thanks, but also and another another a deeper way is there's a deeper responsibility, not just the responsibility that we have to to thank God for what He gives us, but also to use it properly. So if we look at this blessing a little bit deeper, <clears throat> we can we can understand something. There's a question first of all: What does it mean that God gives to the tired? He gives power. Why don't we just say, thank you, God, for giving us power? Why do we have to even include the idea of being tired? And similarly, we can say for all the previous blessings that we talked about, that God gives sensibility to the seeing, if you want to, sense to those who are blind, that God releases, gives freedom to the people who are bound, that God makes straight the people who are bent over. God puts clothes on the people that are naked. Why do we have to mention the negative parts about being blind and and um, and limited and bent over and naked? Why don't we just say thank you, God, that you give us seeing and you give us freedom, you give us the ability to be straight, upright, you clothe us. And in fact, we see that that's really what God does, if, if, what the blessings are. If you look at the blessings after this, Yoiv Koach, that it, the, all the blessings after this don't mention anything bad, that God makes the earth raise up over the water, God prepares the steps of man, He gives us all that we need, He girds us with strength, He crowns us with glory, etc. Only good things. Why are these few blessings that seem to say bad things. <clears throat> so maybe it could be that what these blessings are telling us is a, a little bit different <clears throat> than what we think. Not necessarily that, that being blind is a bad thing and that being bound is a, a negative thing. The same thing with being bent over or being naked. 
and in our case also to be to be weak. Maybe it's not such a, a, a really a bad thing at all. Let's just take this blessing, for instance. Let's take this blessing. What does it mean to be tired? And to be tired means that you tried to do something, you you expended energy, you you made a big effort, and you put out so much energy, you put out so much effort that you're tired. A person that does nothing usually is not tired. <clears throat> In fact, as they say a joke that doing nothing is the hardest work of all because you can't rest. You're always doing nothing. A person that makes an effort and he tries to do something, he tries to change the world, then it says God gives him power. So this is really a, a, a positive thing. It's a positive thing that <clears throat> that is telling us that who does God give power to? Who does God give new powers to? To those who really make an effort. To those who really try. There's a saying, I just read a saying, that 80% of success is just showing up. And we're just making the effort itself. That's the biggest part of success that there can be. And of course, I think we've talked about this before, that in some ways success is just trying. The, just if we make the effort, sometimes that's the biggest success of all. That a person tries to do good. He makes an effort to be kind. He, he, he puts energy into improving the world. <clears throat> what the results are is not so important as the energy that we put into, especially when we understand that really nobody knows what results are gonna come out of anything. Um, the, like there's a saying that the actions are in our hands, but the results are in God's hands. God put the world into our hands right now, what we do. We've spoken about this before. But what the results are going to be are up to God. So really, the, the main thing is the effort that we put into it. And that's what it says, that one who puts effort into something, and that putting effort into something makes you tired, as God gives you power. God gives you strength. <clears throat> There's different types of being tired also. Sometimes a person can be tired from the f fact that he doesn't see any success. <laughs> <clears throat> There's a story that's told, in fact, I heard this story, but the the moral of the story I heard from someone else. There was a well-known rabbi that lived in, in Kfar Chabad, and he was handpicked by the Lubavitcher Rebbe to be the, um, what I call the spiritual head of the yeshiva over here, of the Torah Academy. His name was Rabbi Mendel Futafes. Rabbi Mendel Futafes was a very interesting, very interesting Jew. And uh, even though he he did know Torah very well and he knew how to learn, but that wasn't his main his main attribute. His main attribute was that he was a very very positive person. He was a positive person in uh, in the sense that he he looked at the world the way the Rebbe looked at the world. <clears throat> and he spent uh, seven years of his life in Siberia at hard labor and under very very difficult situation, very difficult conditions. It was cold and there was disease and there wasn't much to eat. And of course, uh, the people that he was around were a lot of them were murderers and they were people that had been rejected basically, a lot of them by society. A lot of the people were there because they were just suspected by Stalin. They say that Stalin killed up to 50 million people just because he suspected them. So people that were there, they hadn't done anything wrong and, and they hadn't, they were there just because of absolutely no reason. So they didn't really have the power and the stamina to feel that they were there for any purpose. At least the person who's a criminal, he knows that he's there because he did some sort of a crime or that as soon as he finishes his sentence, he can get up. But these people were there for absolutely no reason. And it was very common that a person would finish his sentence, let's say three years, five years, and they would add on another five years. So there's a story that Rabbi Mendel Futtafest, Rabbi Mendel Futtafest told me that, um, that all the time he was there, he tried to learn something from every situation that would g give him a positive attitude. Something he tried to to find in everything that he could understand that would give him motivation 
just to keep alive because the the essence the the the, the main weapon a person had in Siberia was his mood as soon as you lost your mood then all suddenly you realized how cold it was and how help, hopeless it was and the diseases that were there you started to get scared and afraid and the other the other prisoners would, would recognize it so they would take advantage of it so he told me a story <clears throat> that when Stalin died Stalin died in 1953 as they started to uh, ease up a little bit on the on the prisoners and that one of the prisoners uh, took advantage of this and he had always claimed that he was a tightrope walker that he was a tightrope walker and he told he used to brag about it how he was a tightrope walker of course when Stalin was alive as you there was no time to do anything except to try to keep alive and um, but as soon as Stalin died, so there was a little bit of time. And this man, this tightrope walker, or at least this self-proclaimed tightrope walker, <coughs> found himself a thick rope, and he strung it up between two buildings, and he asked for permission. They gave him permission that he could walk on the tightrope. And Reb Mendel told me it was about the height of two people, say 10 to 12 feet high. And this tightrope walker got up on the rope, and he started to walk, and everybody was uh, very excited uh, and, uh, and, and entertained. And Reb Mendel had thought that, you know, we have enough problems walking here on the ground. What does a person want to walk on, the, on a rope for? But nevertheless, when he did walk on a rope, it, Reb Mendel, Rabbi Mendel, uh, Futafaz Rabbi Mendel said that he was very, uh, also very uh, enchanted by the whole thing. It was very interesting. And this man had told Rabbi Mendel that he was a tightrope walker and Rabbi Mendel didn't believe him. And he told him he didn't believe him. And now he woke on, walked on the rope and he got in the middle and his old skill came back to him and his old self-confidence. And he was dancing on one foot and another foot and people threw him things and he juggled things and he got to the end. And he got to the end of the rope and he turned around and he walked back. And when he got off, everybody was clapping their hands and he walked over to Rabbi Mendel and he said, um, you didn't think I could do did you do? He said, no, you're right. I didn't think. I didn't think you could do it. You really surprised me. He said, tell me, um, you seem to be a smart person. What do you think my secret is? How do you think a person can walk on the rope? So Rabbi Mendel said, well, to tell you the truth, I was really wondering about that myself. And I can't really figure it out. I can't really figure it out. But one thing I did notice was that when you got to the end of the rope and you turned around, that there was fear in your eyes. And this tightrope walker said to Rabbi Mendel Futavas, you're okay, you're all right. He said, I want to explain to something. I want to explain something to you. <clears throat> the secret is, is that when I'm walking on the rope, I look in general. My eyes are looking generally at everything. I don't look at any one place. But my focus is on the goal, on the end of the rope. And when I get to the end of the rope and I have to turn around, there's one second when I haven't got the goal in mind. And that's a bit frightening. I have to turn around and because I've trained myself and I <clears throat> to not be to not lose my balance at that time, I turn around and I immediately focus again on everything, but my goal is the new goal is the place where I started off from. And that's what keeps me on the on the rope. <clears throat> that's a story I heard. I heard from someone else that he also told the story to, and that he added something on the end of the story. The end of the story was that that tightrope walker, Rabbi Mendel, said that that saved him. Saved him himself. Why? Because Rabbi Mendel said that he had worked so hard all the time to keep positive and to help other people as much as he could and to, to think positive thoughts, and that his batteries just ran out. You know, it, it seemed to be pretty obvious to him that he wasn't going to make it. He wasn't going to get out. He wouldn't see his family. And that all this energy and this effort was just going to be for nothing. You know, why even why even struggle? You know, maybe it's just better just to give up and save himself all the pain and all the aggravation. In any case, there's no point. Nobody even knows where he is. Nobody knows where he's going to be. And he already imagined, you know, how he's going to die over there and they'll throw him to the wolves. Nobody even knows where he's buried. He said, but when that he heard that man say that he, when you get to the end of the rope and you have to turn around, you have to find a new goal, is that's a little scary. Rev Mendel said that's that's a lesson to me. 
So I've gotten to the end of the rope. Now I have to turn around and find a new goal. A new goal. And that's what it means that notain liyoyef koach, that God gives power to those who are tired. And those those people that have made an effort, and they've made an effort in the world, and they say, that's it, I'm giving up. It's just not working. It's not going anywhere. As God will give you power. God will give you new life. Because God put us here so that we'll make a better world, and we'll try. And the world is a very disappointing place. The world is a very confusing and depressing and seemingly totally meaningless and empty place. It's very cold and cruel. But that's why we're here, to make the world a warm and meaningful and a kind and a, and a, and a just place. And it's, it's our job to do it, but it depends totally on our having a good mood when there's no reason to. And that's exactly the reason we're here. And to be in a situation where there seemingly is no meaning and that we should ignore that negativity and put something new into it. To do it on our own is very difficult. As that's what it says that God gives us koach. God gives us power to do it. A lot of times we have to ask him, but for sure God always answers our prayer. We say, God answers the mouth, the prayers of every mouth. And we're talking not only Jews, we're talking about all of God's creations. <clears throat> because all of God's creations are partners in this. It's just that the Jewish people are here to be examples for everybody else because we have a certain deeper connection, family connection, if you want to call it, with, with God. But everyone is God's creation. God, the same God creates us as creates everybody else. So that's what it means that God gives power to the weak, to those people who realize how weak we are without God. And Hashem gives us power that we can overcome. Just take an example, the first Jew, Abraham, stood against the whole world. That's why it's called Abraham or Ivri. Ivri means on the other side. The whole world is on one side and Abraham was on the other side. That's what it says in the Midrash. How can one person stand against the whole world? It makes absolutely no sense. And that's exactly the point. It doesn't make sense. This is something that is above sense. According to sense, according to logic, a person can easily say there's very great philosophers with tremendous genius minds, especially the French philosophers, and they have pages and pages of proof that there's no meaning to the world. They accept it, realize it. And that's not to talk about all the psychiatrists, the psychologists, whatever the Freud and Adler and those people just realize that there's no meaning to the world and that you have to live with this meaninglessness, face the meaninglessness of the world. Well, this is a lie. It's not so. But on the other hand, to put meaning into the world, has to, you have to be superhuman. And God helps us in this superhumanness. That's what we're learning about this week in the portion, the Torah portion about how God took the Jews out of Egypt and he split the sea for them. And it says that when God split the sea, he split all of the water in the world by Yibaku'u Amayim. It says that the water split, not just the sea split. I'm sorry, this is last week's portion. The, 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 the water split. It says all the water in the world, even the spiritual worlds, they all split. And when the spiritual splits, what do we see? The creation of the spiritual, the creator of the world. And he did it for the Jewish people. And so he will do for every single person in the world. That's this week's Torah portion, which is talking about the giving of the Torah. When God took the Jews out of Egypt, he did it all on his own. All the Jews had to do was just be willing, and God kept giving them power and giving them power in order to accept the Torah, to the point where it says that when God gave the Torah to the Jewish people, it said, Hashem oz lamoyitein, God gave power to the Jewish people. When a person thinks that God cares about us so much, that he actually gave us his Torah. He told us what he wants us to do with our hands, with our eyes, with our feet, with our nose, with our mouth, what we should say, what we should do. It's very, very important to God that we use our bodies and everything we have for him. This gives us power. Hashem oz God gives us power to, to go against nature, to defy the, the emptiness of creation and to put happiness and, and meaning into everything that we do. There's a story that's very similar to this, told about the first Rebbe of Chabad, Rabbi Shneer Zalman, 
that once there came a chassid to him, and this chassid said to him, <clears throat> this chassid had been very, very rich, and he used to give a lot of charity, and he had promised charity to a lot of people, and suddenly he lost all of his money. He became a pauper. He even owed money, and he didn't know how to pay it back. Uh, so he went to the Alter Rebbe, to the first Rebbe, that was his, Alter Rebbe was Rabbi Shneur Zalman. He wrote the book called the Tanya. He lived uh, 200, 250 years ago. And he said, uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I need this money in order to pay off debts, in order to give charity. I need the money. So the Rebbe said to him, you told me what you need. But maybe have you ever thought what you are needed for? What God needs you for? He wants you to learn. He wants you to pray. He wants your efforts. And the person realized that he would had made a big mistake. He was putting his his uh, hope in the in his goal was the wrong goal. His goal was that he wanted money in order to do good things with. But that's not where the power came from. The power came from him thinking, listen, what do you want What do you want me for, God? Maybe God wants me to be a pop. Who knows what he wants me to be? I have to give myself over to God. I, he, had, he sat down and he learned. He prayed. He forgot about all of his problems. And sure enough, everything turned around. And he got his riches back as, as he was before. He just opened himself up and let God give him power. That's part of the blessing. God gives power to those who are tired. We have to realize ourselves that we haven't got the energy to change the world on our own. We haven't got the energy to do the changes that we're supposed to. And God will help us. That was the big fault of the Jews that didn't want to go into the land of Israel. <clears throat> the idea of the spies in Parsha Shalach, that God took the Jews into out of Egypt into the desert. And came the time for them to go into Israel. They said, we don't want to go in. <clears throat> and the Lubavitcher Rebbe explains the reason the Jews didn't want to go in was because they thought they were too weak. They thought that if they went into the land of Israel on their own, and God said they were going to go on their own, the, the clouds of glory that were surrounding them in the desert and the manna that fell from heaven and the water that came from the rock weren't going to go with them into the Holy Land. They were going to have to do it all, all on their own. And they thought, we haven't got the power. We can't do it. We're weak. And God says, okay, I know that you're weak, but I'll give you power. I'll be with you. Don't worry about it. And they said, yeah, but you said you're not going to be with us. I mean, here we're in the desert. You're with us, and you're giving us food and everything. But we're all receiving, you know, protection from you, and we're prote every, everything is for you. <clears throat> we don't want to go into the land of Israel. We'll have to leave you. And God said, don't worry. It'll be a new thing. You're going to be in the world, and in the world, I'm going to give you koach. But you have to make an effort. You have to be tight. Make yourself tired here in the desert. You don't get tired. Go into the land of Israel. Become tired. Oh, yeah. Realize that you don't have the power and that God wants you not to have the power so that he'll give you the power. And you'll realize that it's really all coming from him, that he's your partner. He wants to be your partner. So that's what it means. Hashem noten leyoev koach. That God gives power to the weak. I'll just tell, tell you a small story that happened to me. I stopped at a gas station here in Israel. It's right not far from my house. And um, uh, it's a gas station for motorcyclists. Believe it or not, there are motorcyclists in Israel. They're not exactly the, I mean, they're guys with leather jackets and everything like that. But they're nice people. They're really nice people. It could be that all, you know, Hell's Angels are also nice people. I don't really, never met them in any of them. But these people are sort of trying to... Uh, trying to be in that way. I mean, maybe that's their, their nature. Anyway, there they were. In addition to them, there was there was nighttime. They were making a big sort of a, a meal there. And there was also a lot of soldiers, Israeli soldiers, maybe about 50 of them. And they were making this big meal. Some, I don't exactly understand what the reason was for, but, and I heard somebody was playing music. So I went over to see who it was. I play music myself and I like music. So somebody said, oh, it's Bolton. Come play something, play one of your songs. And so they set up a microphone for me, and I played some of my songs, and they really liked it a lot. And they said, say something. Say something. So I really didn't have any, I wasn't planning to say anything. I didn't know what to say. 
Now you should know that there's a big factor of religious people in Israel that say that we don't need an army. God is going to do everything, and the army is just a big bluff, and we don't need it, and it's unnecessary. And the fact is, in the army, they sort of try to make the soldiers as not religious as possible, but th that's already not as uh, exaggerated as it used to be, but still that's there. So these religious people, they have a point. Maybe not a good point, but they have a good, they have a point. So um, they said, say something, say something. So I figured, oh, what am I going to say? Oh, so I said, you soldiers should know that God does everything. God is the, he's the one that really protects us. God is the one who really fights our enemies. God is the one who's protecting the country. He is the one that really does all the battles. And I saw these guys were looking and rolling their eyes. I'm like, who did they put up here? Well, who is this guy? You know, well, this is, we don't have to hear this. And I kept on. I said that God is really fighting the battles. I said, but he's doing it all through you. You are the vessels for it. Without you, I don't know how God would do it. He needs you. And they all stood up and they clapped and they were, they were dancing. It just happened to me, occurred to me, which that's the fact. We have to understand that, that God is our friend and that he wants us to rely on him. That's what it means. I'm saying Leoeth Koach. The people who are tired, that when we realize that we don't have the power to do it alone, we won't run away. God will give us power, and we'll be able to do the impossible. Like it was in the Six-Day War. We saw, in fact, the existence of the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years. Right? We didn't have an army, and we didn't have weapons, we didn't have everything, and here we are. And all these big, amazing countries, you know, the Babylonians and the Romans and things, they're just they're the history. So that's a way we can also explain all the other blessings. And and let's that's a way we can explain all the other blessings. <clears throat> and like we said, first of all, the first blessing is the God you give to the rooster wisdom. And we said, if you remember in that class, that the word sechvi, which means translated as rooster, can also be translated as a, a sentence in Job, the book of Job, uh, chapter 38. And it says over there, it uses the word sechvi to mean the heart. So God gives the heart understanding. That's the first one. Second one, God gives sense, gives, uh, how do you say, awareness, pokeach. He gives senses, uh, sensitivity to the blind. What does it mean blind? When we realize that we're really blind and that we don't see God, we don't really see the truth, we don't see how wonderful God is and how God is creating us and he's providing for us. Once in a while we see a little tiny bit, but essentially we don't see anything as God gives us the senses that we do start to see. He's pokeach who, who does he give these senses to? To people who realize that we're blind. Now there's what I see is not really what's real. It's not the whole picture. It's just the very, very surface of the picture. Those people who think that what I see, that's all that there is, is God doesn't give them senses to see more. But those people who realize that what I see in front of me, it's really just the very surface, really essentially I'm blind. I'm blind to what God really is. And then if a person really realizes that, then he's open to see more, to see what's called hashkacha pratit, to see that God really is around us, helps us, provides for us, loves us, protects us, etc. So pukeach ivrin, God is sensitivity to who to those people who are blind who realize that let's do the second lesson Asurim, that god gives freedom to the people who are bound to a people who are limited uh, as as professor victor frankel said freedom without responsibility is chaos freedom god gives us freedom who does he give freedom to to those people who put themselves within the limits of the torah of what's good and what's bad a person who puts himself in things that are forbidden, asur, and things that are permissible, things a person that puts himself within that framework, asurim, that he limits himself in that way, that he can't do what he wants to, is God matir. Then God gives you true freedom. And uh, interesting, Victor Frankl wanted to make, Professor Victor Frankl wanted to make, just like there is on the East Coast, of America, a Statue of Liberty. He wanted to make a statue of responsibility on the West Coast. I don't think they've gathered enough money to do it, but it was a serious idea. They wanted to do it, but it's a good point. It's a good point. Responsibility means you're limited, and matir means that you're free. 
who does God really make free that you really feel that you can be happy, you can be free, is when you have a proper limitations, a proper framework, just like a body. When can a person be healthy? If his body is limited, if it's unlimited, there's a hole somewhere that's not supposed to be, is, that's trouble. Zokev kafufim, that God makes straight, he makes proud. Zokev means to be proud. He makes proud those people who are humble, kafufim. If you humble, just humble yourself in front of the Creator, kafufim, those people specifically, God makes pride. He gives you pride and 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 accomplishment, a feeling of accomplishment that means to be zokef, standing the mute, like it says Larzeno. And Malbi Sharumi, when we realize how naked we really are, that we really have nothing of our own, is then God gives us the garments. You start to appreciate what the Torah is, what commandments are, then you appreciate the garments that God has given us. And the same is also that God gives to the to the, those people who are tired, only to those people who are tired, does he give power, does he give energy. So when we say these blessings, we should think about a little bit, not just when we make the blessings, but the whole entire, whole entire day, the great kindness of, um, of God that he gives us the power to serve him. And with this power, says, Hashem owes Lamoyitain. Hashem gives power to his people with the Torah. Hashem Yavorechatamo Shalom. He gives the Jewish people peace. And not just the Jewish people, but all people. When we realize that our power and our strength comes from the creator of the universe, and the creator of the universe means he created, he's creating us also. And he's creating us every moment. And in fact, we're more important than anything else in the universe. As that itself gives us a psychological help. Uh, uh, a happiness and an energy. But even more, God actually gives us hope and happiness and energy and positiveness and meaning in our lives every single moment. And we have to thank God for that. And that's why we make the blessing in the morning. Hanoten leyoef koach, that God you give to those people who try, who make an effort and become tired, become... How do you say uh, 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 disheartened because we put so much energy and don't get any results? And suddenly you realize a new realization that the the struggle itself is worth more than even the results and the results God gives. So God gives us new energy, new power to withstand any difficulties as the Jews have been doing for the last 2,000 years. But let us all pray that there won't be any more difficulties and God will give us just happiness so that we can dance and be happy and be joyous more and more than we want to. Like it says, that God will give us blessings without any limit. It says, until your lips become tired from saying the words, Die, die, die. And if you notice know that your lips aren't used when you say die, die means enough, enough, enough. Enough is you do use your lips enough. <clears throat> but that we should be tired. That's what we should be tired from, from thanking God for all the good and the wonderful things that he has given to us. So I bless all of you. You should have a good week full of good news and um, good energy and that we should energize other people as well. So have a good week, everyone. And this week should be Mashiach now with a new world, with a new Beit HaMikdash, and all the Jews together in, Egypt, in Israel, going out of Egypt, in Israel, and peace should be to the whole entire world. Shavuot Tov. Amen, Shavuot Tov. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, see you all next week. Hey, oh, any questions? Anybody have any questions? No questions, comments. I really enjoyed the story with the um, with Rabbi Futafas, where you said oh, yeah. that we have to change the 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 perspective to change the uh, right. to to right. set new goals. Powerful story. Yes. A powerful story. Thank you. Okay. Good. God bless you all. We'll talk later. Goodbye. All the best. Have a support of two, bye.